Welcome to the podcast. I'll introduce myself, Katina Michael, guest editor of the IEEE Computer Special Issue you are now reading on Big Data. We begin this podcast with a look at how Big Data can help little people. I'm speaking here of babies who are effectively born premature. Internationally, some 10% of children are born prematurely, and in Canada, for instance, early births are responsible for three quarters of all infant deaths. So what does Big Data have to do with premature infants? To speak to us today on this topic, I welcome Professor Carolyn McGregor, who is the Canada Research Chair in Health Informatics, based out of the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. Carolyn has had a long association with the IEEE Engineering in Medicine and Biology Society, and among her achievements has received a multi-million dollar IBM First of a Kind Research Award. Carolyn, welcome to the program. Thank you, Katina. Carolyn, as a mother of three, may I begin by saying that your work in the neonatal intensive care units is both inspiring and groundbreaking. Can you tell us about how your research into neonatal intensive care units began? It's an interesting story and journey for me, really. I started off graduating from a computing science degree and working for a bank in Australia. And I was asked at the time to work on a new computing system that they wanted to implement for the chief executive officer and the top executives within the bank. It was known then as an executive information system. But these really were the first wave of analytics environments that were being implemented in Australia and indeed around the world. So for the first time we implemented these computing systems on the desktops of the different executives. I was asked to do the same thing for one of the largest retail chains in Australia as well. So I was building up quite a wealth of experience working in analytics and I indeed continued on as a consultant in that area for a number of years. And then in 1999, while I was completing some research in the area with the university, I was asked to meet with a neonatologist who cares for these premature babies, uh, who had come to the university with a wish that he be able to use every breast and every heartbeat rather than just having information summarised down to a reading every hour. And for me, the problem from a computing context was very similar, whether we were trying to understand customer behaviour or supplier behaviour, to starting to understand the behaviour of those tiny babies. But the problem in critical care and particularly neonatal intensive care is so much more complex than the problems in the retail and finance domain. Ironically, when I met the neonatologist back in 1999, I was actually pregnant with my first child. It had been a long journey to get to that point. Um, and as it turned out for us, um, we found out that my daughter had a very rare chromosome abnormality and she was born premature and she passed away. So my husband and I felt the full force of what it is like to have and lose a child. And I came to realise that in the case of my own daughter, that nothing could have happened to change the outcome for her because her destiny was right in that very first cell divide. But that there are so many other babies in the neonatal intensive care unit setting who have a great potential for a wonderful outcome in their own life and with their family. And when you have felt the, uh, the grief that stays with you through all of your life, then you, I, I feel motivated to do anything that I can to take the skills that I learned from banking and retail and finance and apply them in a domain where I can help save the lives of these tiny babies. Can you describe to us what a neonatal intensive care unit looks like when you enter it? When you enter a neonatal intensive care unit, your senses across all dimensions are heightened to the sounds. The first thing you have are the sounds of all the medical devices providing the beep, beep, beep of the heartbeat. At probably two times a second at least, because the average neonatal heart beats at 120 times or more a minute. You also have blood oxygen saturation alarms firing every now and again if the baby's blood oxygen saturation has fallen. Visually, you see these incubators with very tiny babies inside 
there are some term babies who are in breathing room air and they're not in those covered environments. Those that are in those covered incubators, they are usually covered over, so it's very hard to even see the baby because they have the blankets over because they're trying to protect the developing eye from too much light. And around that incubator or the baby is with breathing room air in an open bed context, a number of different medical devices are crowded around them providing support, providing information and all flashing up numbers in different times and in different contexts. The smell of the environment, sometimes you can have that sterile type of smell. Uh, there's a lot of hand washing occurring, a lot of sanitation. Sometimes you can be smelling that. So it's quite a busy, complex environment, very intensive. But at the same time, you feel the compassion, you feel the caring of all the people who are the healthcare providers in that environment, the parents who are going in to see their baby, and you're emotionally connected in that setting with the beauty of the start of life. Well, what a description. You've just given me this visualisation of this tiny person that's breathing uh, with medical devices around him or her. Can you tell me now what the link is between big data and little people? Every breath and every heartbeat in those premature babies matters and we need to watch them and we need to support them as they grow. They are trying to grow in an environment they weren't designed to, particularly in the case of these premature babies. They're meant to still be in amniotic fluid. Their heart is meant to still have a different function. They're meant to be receiving oxygen in a different way than being forced to breathe. Because through the birthing process, the lungs have to take on a different function too early and the heart has to change its function so it pumps the oxygen around that's coming from the lungs and the eyes need to develop outside that amniotic fluid environment and also the brain. There is a lot of stress that's put on to that tiny baby. They need to be monitored and watched every moment as they grow. They are in a very critical state. They could have pauses in their breathing. Their brain is in a, such a state of development that they can forget to breathe. Their eyes can be permanently damaged and they can go blind. Their lungs can be permanently damaged if they don't receive the right support with oxygen that's taking into account the lung development at the time and trying to ensure that that baby receives the right level of oxygen. So there is an immediate need for the nursing staff to watch every beat and every breath and that's what those alarms and all of those sounds and sensory stimuli are for for the nursing staff. But what we're starting to discover is that if we use advanced computing tools to watch every beat of the heart and every breath and analyse that, we can start to see when a baby's becoming unwell because they're um, starting to have to fight off an infection. We can start to see the impact of oxygen levels that could potentially impact the development of the eye. We can start to see the impact of pain management drugs on the body and a range of different things. So a baby's heart beats more than 7,000 times in an hour they breathe more than 2,000 times and their blood oxygen is taken and flashes on a screen 3,600 times in an hour. And on a traditional either paper chart or an electronic health record, one number is written for the heart rate, heart rate for the hour, one number is written for the respiration rate and one number is written for the blood oxygen. So we have three orders of magnitude of data loss just in those three vital sign areas alone. That is just an awesome description of the statistics. Um, makes you wonder on the amount of data actually flowing, flowing from the patient. So essentially what you're saying, Carolyn, is that big data can save lives. Big data definitely has the potential to save lives. We have the potential to detect infection earlier, that's really important because in these tiny babies every minute and every hour counts because infection can take hold in a body that has a very immature immune system, 
much quicker than anybody else. We have situations when babies, particularly at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, one of our collaborative partners, a lot of their babies need to undergo surgery. And for those babies, they are more susceptible to potentially having infection. Also, considering the development, as I said, of the eye, the brain, the lungs, we've got great potential to really help the survival and the quality of life for these tiny babies. I'm going to ponder now on a grey area, Carolyn, with respect to the ethical limits of using big data to save lives. Can you make any generic comments about that? I think that ethics is something that's often considered in this context. So there's a couple of perspectives. One is the medical ethics about how young the babies are um, and they consider that there's a, a viable outcome and they go right down to uh, 23 weeks gestation so that's 17 weeks early, um, providing um, the type of support and care that we have um, means that for those babies who are surviving from that very early birth stage that they have the potential to have a better outcome. So in the last 20 years, rather than only 10% of babies born that early surviving, we now have 90%. Um, but then we have a situation where some of those, a lot of those children have uh, behavioural problems, ADHD, when they're trying to go through school. So we have some lifelong challenges still with these babies and we're trying to work with that now as well. Some of the other ethical considerations are the use of some of the data uh, for clinical research studies. We found in a uh, public opinion survey that's been conducted as part of our research in both Australia and in Canada that there's overwhelming support uh, from the public to be able to utilise data coming from medical devices in the identified way to support clinical research to start to uncover those common trends and patterns that are ex existent in this physiological data streams before a range of different conditions are traditionally detected and diagnosed. Well, it's great to see somebody uh, in this space uh, so knowledgeable about the ethical implications as well as the challenges. Uh, can you perhaps apply this technique that you've applied to neonatal intensive care units to other demographic populations in society? This is one of the really exciting outcomes from the research that we've been working on today, that it really has such great applicability. There's two reasons why starting in the neonatal space has been of interest to me. Uh, for personal reasons, to support families with um, helping their babies survive. But also because, traditionally, because babies go through a standard week-to-week -week gestational development, any baby born at 27 weeks gestation, if it doesn't have some classical problem, um, what's known as a congenital abnormality, so or something like um, Down syndrome or one of these other conditions, if it's just that they've been born early, then many, many 27 week gestational babies born at that stage have the very similar organ development. So it take, makes the population very similar to work with. Um, but we can, we found that the work that we have is great applicability. You can take it into the child space, the adult space, to be able to look for different things, whether it's infection or use some other indicator. But you can also take what we're doing into the home. So if someone who is a chronic condition patient or an ambulatory care patient, or someone who is dealing with cancer, leukemia, a diabetes, any of these chronic type conditions and requires a mechanism to monitor them so that they are kept in track in terms of their medical monitoring and they don't have to present to emergency when the situation becomes extremely dire. We have a platform that allows you to send that medical data through the internet and have it being processed in the cloud, which has enormous potential in the future for clinical care. Do you envisage, Carolyn, that everyone will potentially be wearing these uh, continuous monitors and wirelessly sending back to base their physiological characteristics? I'm thinking here of the quantified self-movement uh, and the potential for us all to be wearing these monitors for preventive uh, health. 
I think that there is great potential for that. I think in a case of wearing monitoring, I think there's a lot of work to be done from two perspectives. The first perspective is providing those monitoring mechanisms that become ubiquitous, that aren't intrusive, and that provide you with, um, secondly, that provide you with data at that appropriate um, frequency that you need the data to be provided. So that um, the intensive monitoring that we have of the electrocardiogram signal, which is that classical waveform you see of the behaviour of the heart, it comes down to a question of whether you need that degree of granularity or that low level detail for someone who is healthy that just wants to do that proactive monitoring or do they just need some sort of a derived heart rate. But there's certainly enormous potential that people can uh, take on board their own health care. The other main area is the challenge of what we know as artefact. When we move, when we might take the sensor off for a while or if something happens then we have to have the ability to give the most truest signal of what our body is doing through to the computing system. One of the beauties in neonatology is that a lot of the times the baby sleeps and they're left to sleep and as much of the interventions are grouped together when they're awake when it's possible. Whereas um, as adults and children when they sleep less running around and we need to be able to have the mechanisms to capture the true signal of what our heart's doing without what we know as that artifact. Well, Carolyn McGregor, thanks for joining us. You've given us much to reflect on in this single big data case study context in the medical space. And we wish you all the best on this admirable research path you're on in critical care. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia.